Alrighty, it's your boy Karar with another Cam Crash course. Alright, if you're watching this out of context, you probably think I'm really cringe, but I'm actually not, okay? I, oh, I kinda am. Moving on, moving on, okay? Hello everybody, I'm Karar, and today we are going to be talking about chemical equilibrium, if you weren't able to read that, but you probably couldn't because I wrote it. But, we are going to be talking about how chemical reactions balance themselves, because that's what equilibrium means. Now because it means balance, it doesn't tell you anything about the speed at which it balances, it just says where it balances. That's all the chemical equilibrium can tell you, so do not try to figure out how fast the reaction is happening by using anything we talk about in this video. Except at the end, we'll have a little piece on that. So now, the most important thing to understand about equilibrium is the equilibrium constant. Because once you understand the equilibrium constant, everything else falls into place. Basically, the equilibrium constant is the ratio of your products to your reactant. So let us say we have the reaction N2 plus 3H2 yields uh, 2 NH3. This is basically the Hayward Bosch product. Oops, I forgot my backward error. Don't forget, in equilibrium, you always have forward and backward reactions happening at the same time. And the definition of equilibrium is when those are equal. So let's say we wanted to find the equilibrium constant of this reaction, symbolized K. Now, when I'm finding the equilibrium constant, I don't care. I don't, like, it doesn't even cross my mind whether it's K, KSP, KA, KV, KW. I don't care. Just leave, keep it to yourself, okay? I literally don't care. The only thing I care about is the reaction and the phases of matter of the reaction, reactants and products. So let's write it in. All of these guys, thankfully, are gases. So when you're finding the equilibrium constant, you basically go with the products first and you say NH3 is the first product and we basically symbolize this with concentration of NH3. You can either do concentration or you can do pressure. And then you take this coefficient that's in front of it and you put it to the power of that. So we do NH3 squared. And then in the denominator, we got to do the reactant. So we first got N2 which does not have a, which has a coefficient of 1, so we don't put a power, and then we have H2, which is coefficient of 3, so we put it as a third power. Okay, so this is our equilibrium expression. Now, you have to be careful, because in this case, we got lucky and they're all gases, but whenever you're calculating an equilibrium constant, you have to ignore solids and liquids. The only thing that matter are gases and aqueous solutions. So you might be asking, Carraro, why don't you care whether it's K or KB or KSP or whatever nonsense? The reason is because if you only care about the phase of matter, it eventually gives you the right equilibrium constant regardless. For example, KSP, right? Let's see. So let's say you have AGCL yields AG plus plus CL minus, and it wanted us to find the KSP of this. If we write out the phase of the matter, we say that this is solid, because it's a solid that you want to dissolve, and then it goes into aqueous solution once it dissolves. So, if we use the same strategy we used before, we use the product, so AG plus, no coefficients to deal with here, CL minus, we don't have to put in this because it's a solid. And we didn't even have to think about it, but we did get the KSP properly. The only thing you have to know is the re uh, reaction and the phase of the matter, and you automatically get everything. Let's do a KV and KA example. So, for KA, we could say H2SO4 plus H2O yields H3O plus plus HSO4 minus. And basically, we know that this is aqueous, this is a liquid, this is aqueous, and this is also aqueous. And then we know that this is a Ka because we're dealing with an acid dissociating and we don't even have to worry about the fact that it's Ka and we can just write the equilibrium as we always did. H3O plus times HSO4 minus over H2SO4. And we didn't even have to think about what it means to have a Ka. We just found the equilibrium constant for the reaction and we are Gucci gang 21, 69, I don't care. Okay, so what the heck does the K value actually tell us? It tells us how much the products are favored over the reactants, right? So you're putting concentration of products over concentration of reactants. So if your K is really big, that means that you want to have a lot more concentration of products. If K is really small, then you want to have less products and a lot of reactants. Whoops, this should be equilibrium. But anyway, another thing we can do with equilibrium is tell us which way the reaction is going to go from our given position. So equilibrium constant is when your system is at equilibrium, what that ratio is equal to. But your system is not always at equilibrium, right? So let's go back to our Haber-Bosch example. So let us say that we had like 0.1 atmospheres of NH3 and 0.2 atmospheres of H2 and then 0.05 atmospheres of N2. I just made these numbers up, so there's no way that this is already at equilibrium. So how do we know which way it's going to go? Is it going to make more NH3 or is it going to make more NH2? What the heck is NH2? N2 or H2? Well, we know that by doing Q. And the way you find Q is exactly the same as finding K, except it's at its current time. What is that ratio equal to right now, even though it might not be at equilibrium? So we'll calculate it. 0.1 squared over 0.2 times 0.05, and then this has to be Q. And basically, if this Q value is greater than our K, 
then we know that there's too many products because the numerator is way bigger than the denominator and we don't want that. So that means that the reaction is going to keep going left. It's going to produce more N2 and H2 because it's not yet at equilibrium and it wants to get rid of the product. If it's the other way around, if it's less than K, then it'll go the other way. Okay, so that's how you use Q. Q is at uh, any instant in time. K is what it wants to be at equilibrium. All right, let us quickly go over what KP versus KC is because these are the only two that are actually different from each other. So KP, the P stands for pressure. And it's basically when you use pressures instead of concentration because you could do that with Ks. And then KC, what do you expect? Using concentration. Now the way I like to remember the difference between these two is because like your pressure times volume is equal to NRT by the ideal gas law, right? So your N over V, which is equal to your concentration is gonna be equal to P over RT. So let's say that Kp is equal to Pa times Pb over Pc, right? This corresponds to the reaction C goes to A plus B. And these are all gases because we have pressure. And then we also know that the Kc is going to be concentration of A times concentration of B over concentration of C. So if we plug in this equation for over here, we get Rt squared in the, uh, in the numerator denominator, and then we get an Rt to the first power in the denominator denominator, and we're left with this Kc is equal to Pa times Pb over Rt Pc. So basically, all I'm trying to show you is that Kp and Kc are very different. And if you want to see how they're different, just take this equation that I showed you and plug it in to the corresponding concentration equation and you should be good. But anyway, this is like pretty advanced stuff. So I don't think it's going to be on the AP exam. I'm not sure. Our teacher taught us, but she mentioned it very briefly, so I don't think it would be that useful. Okay. Okay, two more things. Lachat and finding rate laws. Okay, so Lachat, it basically says that your system is going to contract any change in it. So basically there's like four ways in which this could work. So let's go to Haber-Bosch again. And Haber-Bosch is pretty endothermic. I'm pretty sure. Let me just <laughs> verify this. Wow, I'm very good at this. Ecto exos exothermic. I can speak too. Exotherm. Okay, so the fourth thing that can happen is first you increase one of the reactants. So Lachat says it wants to undo that. So how's it going to do that? It's going to take this reaction towards the right because if you increase the reactants and you want to get rid of them, you have to turn them into more product. So we'll draw an arrow that says the uh, our equilibrium is shifting right to increase product. Exactly the same except opposite logic. Okay, increase temperature. The way I like to think about this is like if going forward in the reaction releases heat, right, exothermic, then if you increase the temp, you want to get rid of heat, right? You don't want to make more. So instead of going right, which makes more heat, it'll actually go left. Okay, that probably confuse you even more because it's my left, not your left. Whatever, you get that idea, left. And then the last thing is uh, reducing size of the container. Now this only applies with things with gases in them, and you basically compare the right side number of gas molecules and the left side number of gas molecules. So if you reduce the container size, right, each molecule of gas takes up a certain amount of space. So if you want to counteract the change of getting a smaller container, you also want to reduce the size of the gas molecule. And in order to do that, you just want to reduce the number of gas molecules overall. So if you reduce the container size, you want to move to the side that has less gas molecules, and in this case, that's the right. So your reaction is going to move right. Okay, very epic, that's the shaft. Let us talk about the last important thing determining rate laws. Alrighty, here's the epic problem I found off the internet, and it basically gives you a bunch of rate laws and it wants you to find the overall rate law of the reaction. So my favorite way to approach this problem is just to write as many equations as you can. Of course, the first thing you gotta recognize is what's the rate determining step? That's right, the slow step, because everything's gonna get traffic jammed at the slow step because that guy's taking the long. It's like if you're running in a line, right? The fast guys are gonna run, but then the guys behind, the slow guy, are just gonna get stuck. Okay, whatever, I don't know how this analogy is going, but you get the idea. The slow step is the rate determining step. If the front guy is slow, everybody below, behind him is gonna be slow. So essentially, the rate of the overall reaction is just the rate of the slow step. And when you're given elementary steps, you're allowed to use the coefficient to determine the rate law. So in this case, the rate law right now is KNO2 times NO3. However, our actual reaction doesn't have any NO3 in it. So like, this rate law doesn't really make much sense because we shouldn't have to know about intermediates in order to determine the rate law of an overall reaction. So we somehow had to get rid of this NO3. So where can we write equations? Well, we can't write any equation for kinetics because kinetics is purely expression. You can't write any equation. So what do we have to write equation for? That's right, equilibrium. That's why we're talking about equilibrium today. Get it? Ha ha. Uh, no, I don't know what I'm saying. So basically, if we write the equilibrium expression, basically, you know, the forward rate is equal to the backward rate. So K1 N2 O5 is equal to K negative 1 NO2 NO3. Now what I like to do is just ignore all the K's, okay? 
we don't care about k's because eventually they'll all just like be there'll be some random like k1 over k negative 1 over k times k times another k3 times k2 but we don't care because that all could just be written as a single k we could say that this new k k prime that we made up is equal to all the other k's so we could just ignore them so we have no2 no3 here we have n205 here and we want to get rid of the no3 but we could literally just plug in the n205 for no2 times no3 and we get that our rate law is equal to n205 but don't forget we have to put back our k so let's put our k and boom we got our rate law let's say for example that this over here was a 2 right then this over here would be no2 squared n205 squared and then this over here would be n205 squared as well so that's just how you do rate laws you first look at the slow step and set its rate to the overall rate okay so you got that then you look at the equilibrium step and you write an equation and then once you get the equation you want to see what's in the reactant side and you want to get rid of anything that's not on the reactant side by using substitution elimination whatever strategy you want and you should only have two things to worry about your expression that you got from the rate determining step and your equilibrium uh, equation all right very happy that's all i got to talk about if you guys want more of these crash courses just let me know as always if you enjoyed the video leave a like and subscribe for more Hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching again. See you guys next time.